Good afternoon, and welcome to Research in Action, brought to you by the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University. My name is Karen Scapinato. I'm today's moderator, and I welcome you back after we had a summer break. I'm glad to see you all back here to hear about all the interesting and great things that are going on in research at Florida Atlantic University. Before I introduce today's speaker, just as a reminder on how to ask questions, if you hover your mouse in the bottom of your screen, you see a little Q&A button there. If you click on this button, a little pop-up window comes up and please type your questions there. You can type the questions uh, throughout the entire uh, presentation. We will get to as many questions as we can um, throughout uh, at the end of the presentation today. If we should have more questions than we have time for, uh, we will ask today's presenter to answer those questions offline. And those answers will be posted together with a recording of today's presentation on our website. You can find that at Florida Atlantic University Research in Action. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Greg Fields. Dr. Fields is now the director of uh, one of our research institutes, which is called Human Health and Disease Intervention, and uh, focuses on cancer, um, infectious diseases, uh, and a few other uh, areas that uh, Greg, Dr. Fields can talk about. Today's presentation will be on a very interesting topic that he has in collaboration with a company on Alzheimer's. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Fields. Okay, Karen, thank you very much for that introduction. And yeah, as, as, she, as Karen mentioned, today I'm gonna to be talking about some advances that are being made in terms of Alzheimer's treatments and also being able to diagnose the disease. So with that, let me go ahead and, and start with uh, my, my presentation here. So <clears throat> as the title indicates, I'm gonna talk about new approaches to treating and monitoring Alzheimer's disease. And some of the work I'm going to be talking about has, is done here at Florida Atlantic University in collaboration with some of our clinical partners. Other things I'll be talking about are advances that are being made elsewhere. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to, you know, after this seminar, we'll be able to feel a little bit better about where Alzheimer's disease treatment is going. Now, I do need to start with some background about Alzheimer's disease. I don't know what the familiarity is amongst the audience here. So let me go ahead and just uh, go through some very basics and, you know, and we'll get some, some pretty strong science too as we go along here. Uh, one of the, really, really when Alzheimer's disease was first recognized, it had to do what happened in changes in the brain. And this illustration is, is a little dramatic, but nonetheless, it does show what happens over the course um, in the brain when someone is in, has Alzheimer's disease. So this is a normal brain, um, which is, you know, it's, it's fairly, uh, you know, intact, there's no gaping holes in it, it hasn't trunk at all. Um, but what happens in Alzheimer's disease over time, it's first really see an overall shrinkage of the brain. You see things are much smaller here. There is extreme shrinkage in the hip, hip, uh, hippocampus. Um, you can see these holes that start to open up in the brain, these, these, these ventricles. So, you know, this is obviously very detrimental to one's health as, you know, the brain shrinks and changes its shape. Now, why does this happen? Okay, why, you know, why does the brain change so dramatically in the course of this disease? And much of it has to do with the death of various cell types in the brain. And that causes then the brain to lose its form and start to shrink down and then these holes are created. Okay, so why do cells in the brain die during Alzheimer's disease? Now, one of the first uh, areas that was recognized as contributing to cell death in the brain during Alzheimer's is formation of what's called this beta amyloid pl plaque, okay? So there's a protein that exists in, in cells in the brain and it's called amyloid precursor protein or APP. And that's shown here. <clears throat> and you can see this protein is sticking out of a cell membrane. So here's the inside of a cell, here's the outside. And it's a long protein that, that juts out. Now, what will happen over time is that various enzymes will chew on this protein and remove different pieces of it. These enzymes are referred to as proteases, and I'll talk a little bit more about the specific proteases involved in this process in just a few moments. Greg, so do you want to switch to presentation mode on your slides? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm in that, okay. Thank you, Karen. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so, um, so what happens though is as the, these different pieces are liberated, <clears throat> 
there's this one piece from sort of the middle of the protein, if you will, and that's referred to as beta amyloid. And this beta amyloid starts to associate with itself and it forms a plaque. And beta amyloid plaques are one of the truly distinct features of people who have Alzheimer's disease. These plaques show up throughout the brain. And <clears throat> what happens is these plaques are toxic to cells. So they can start to kill cells that are surrounding where these plaques are. So this is, as I said, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, the appearance of these beta amyloid plaques. So as you might imagine, as people have thought about designing drugs that may work against Alzheimer's, there's two schools of thought. One is maybe you target these proteases so that they don't cleave the beta, the APP and create the beta amyloid. The other is target the beta amyloid, either break up this plaque or have a way to remove it from the brain. Um, and I'll discuss these various options for treating Alzheimer's as we move along through the presentation. Now, one problem though that comes from the initial thought about how Alzheimer's starts or the cause of the disease is that as I've shown here in the initial one, I show this beta amyloid forming outside the cell. So when enzymes were initially targeted, they were looking at inhibitors for enzymes that are gonna work out here. Well, the problem is more recent studies have shown that beta amyloid actually also occurs inside the cell. So this is this thing called this, this panthos, which is here is beta amyloid being formed inside a cell. This is a cell nucleus. And it's just shown in these two different images. So here's the nucleus and here's all this beta amyloid. So <clears throat> this more recent data indicates that beta amyloid forms inside the cell and then either the cell dies and it, and, it, and it then goes out of the cell or it goes out of the cell before cell death. But nonetheless, this occurs prior to it being outside the cell. Now, why is this important? Well, oops, excuse me. Going back to, I mentioned about some of the design for therapeutic agents. If you're designing drugs to stop these proteases that work outside the cell, well, that's not going to be very effective if the beta amyloid is actually being formed inside the cell. In other words, this is already too late. So this may lead to an understanding of why some of the therapeutic designs for these enzymes were not effective in clinical trials of patients who had Alzheimer's disease, possibly because the beta amyloid is already forming inside the cell and then gets exported out. So in targeting the enzymes at this point is really not very effective. Okay, so let's talk about then what these enzymes are. I don't wanna to be too mysterious about this. So this is our first, what I'll call sort of scientific slide, if you will. So here's amyloid precursor protein. And what happens in the case of the formation of the beta amyloid is first there's a removal of this piece and that's why an enzyme called beta secretase. And then that's followed up by gamma secretase, which, re, which cleaves here and here's your beta amyloid, and that will start to aggregate, and that's what is toxic to cells. So one area that's now being pursued is how this occurs inside the cell, all right? Because even this form shows it being, here's the cell membrane, and this is all going on outside the cell. But we now know this goes on inside the cell. So what is responsible for that? Now, the other part of this whole process that's a little frustrating from the point of trying to design drugs to combat Alzheimer's disease is that there's a whole nother pathway going this way. So now again, we have the same APP, the amyloid precursor protein, but now there's this alpha secretase cleavage, which knocks off this part. And then that's followed up by this gamma secretase, which again cleaves here. And now you have this molecule. Okay, so our problem is that now this can actually be cytotoxic. So if we go up this pathway, it can also produce some very bad things for patients, for people, and ultimately resulting in Alzheimer's. Um, so another thought is, well, if you design inhibitors here, you can still go this way and still have a problem. So there's a thought about, do we design inhibitors against this enzyme, or do we move away from enzymes and just start to focus more on these products? And really what I'm going to talk about today is not so much focusing on trying to block these enzymes and their action but rather thinking about the products that are produced and how do we deal with those. Okay, so one of the ways that beta amyloid is detected is through positron emission tomography or PET, where there's a radio labeled 
uh, compound that's going to react with the beta amyloid. And I just want to show kind of the dramatic difference between what goes on in the normal brain versus those who have Alzheimer's disease. So beta amyloid is present in the normal brain. Part of our normal process is to produce beta amyloid. It just gets cleared out of the brain relatively efficiently. But what can happen over time is that that clearance mechanism stops and you can see the incredible accumulation of beta amyloid. I think these images are fairly dramatic in showing how much is present in the brain, <clears throat> really no matter what angle you're looking at it from. So our problem here isn't that we produce beta amyloid, we do it normally. It's that it starts to accumulate in the brain in, in very large amounts and that's what's responsible for quite a bit of cell death that we then see occur. Now, beta amyloid is not the only problem in <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease. Let's also notice that inside the cell, you have these neurofibrillary tangles, and this is due to a protein called tau. And what happens in tau is that it's modified, and a whole bunch of phosphates are added to this protein, and then it starts to aggregate and produce these tangles. And these tangles are also very bad inside the cell. They are responsible for cell death. So when one thinks about really the two main mechanisms of why cells start to die in Alzheimer's disease, it's really the combination of these tangles and the beta amyloid plaque. So if we have normal neurons in the brain that are healthy, that's fine, but then these tangles start to occur inside the cell, <clears throat> the plaques end up outside the cell, and this is what's going to be responsible for the cell death. So when one thinks about targeting these, you know, targeting this disease therapeutically, we're really looking at a couple of different mechanisms and how do we target them? Do we target both the tangles and the plaque separately? Are they interrelated? In other words, as you start to form the plaque, does that also start forming the tangles? And that does appear to be the case. <clears throat> so one has to think about, you know, what are going to be the most effective ways to approach this as we move, as we move forward? Okay, so now I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little bit scratchy here today. So as we're, now we're gonna move into you know, progress towards more effective drug treatments. What are some of the ideas that are out there and what are their pluses and minuses? And, and many of these are ones that are in different, different uh, clinical trials right now. So we're gonna start out with the one that probably has gotten the most attention over the last few years. It's the, um, and, and I will say in advance, I have a very tough name with the, a tough time pronouncing the names, these various drugs that I'm going to talk about. So anyway, this is a, a Ducanumab, okay? And this was, this started out, it's an anti-amyloid therapy. So the idea is that this is an antibody that's going to trap that beta amyloid that I talk about. So the beta amyloid is outside the cell, this antibody is going to trap it, and then that whole antibody complex with the beta amyloid is going to be cleared from the brain. So this was tested, it got all the way to phase three clinical trials. It was tested on patients who had mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's and just mild Alzheimer's dementia. Now, originally this was halted in March, 2019, but then as the data was looked at a little bit more carefully, what they found is that there was a reduction in clinical decline in terms of effects on cognition and function. So they saw a slower decline in these patients, but also there really was a pretty dramatic reduction in beta amyloid as well as tau. So by clearing out the beta amyloid, it had some effect on the phosphorylated tau and the, and the tangles I mentioned earlier. So this was revisited. Um, the FDA granted a priority due in August 2020, and then the FDA approved this drug in 2021 for treatment of Alzheimer's patients. So right now, this is the one drug out there that is approved for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Now, another one that's coming along pretty quickly is this uh, donanumab. And this is also an anti-beta amyloid antibody. Um, again, it's applied where people are starting to show some loss of cognition, early symptomatic Alzheimer's. Um, in its phase two trial, it showed significant slowing of cognitive decline, daily function. Um, now, anyone under this must test positive for amyloid and tau by positronic emission tomography. And what they found is that 
you know, it did indeed lower beta amyloid. And actually, once the plaque level was lowered, volunteers were able to switch to a placebo. Now, a larger phase two clinical trial is still ongoing for this particular antibody. All right, so now I'm going to put together a whole bunch of potential therapeutic agents. Now, you can read almost every day of a new drug being uh, discussed as far as potential treatment for Alzheimer's. So what I'm going to try to focus on here is several different classes and sort of where they are. Now, I've already mentioned two that fall into this category. So these are ones that buy, bind beta amyloid, they're monoclonal antibodies, and ultimately they lower the level of the beta amyloid plaque and improve the clearance of these beta amyloid uh, aggregates that occur in the brain. So I've mentioned this first one, this is FDA improved. I've mentioned this one, which is now in phase two clinical trials. But we also have two others, this uh, lecanemab, which is now in phase three clinical trials, and this Gantiner or MAB, excuse me again, my pronunciation, which is also phase three clinical trials. So these all have similar mechanisms. They're really targeting the beta amyloid, but in the, at the same time, they seem to reduce the amount of the tangles produced by the phosphorylated tau. Um, there are some issues with all of these. One of the biggest problems is that antibodies have a very tough time getting into the brain. And I'll talk about that in just a few moments, ways to potentially work through that. Um, let me go to a couple other potential therapeutics that are out there. So UB311 is actually a vaccine. And um, this has been shown to reduce the levels of the beta amyloid, all, all of the various forms of the aggregates, as well as the plaque. Now, this has only been shown in transgenic mice, but this is now moving into clinical trials. And there is, there's a company that actually is producing this particular vaccine. So this is, this is quite interesting. Now, we also have antibodies such as this one that are targeted towards tau specifically. And this one has been shown to reduce the tau pathology, meaning you reduce those tangles that occur within cells. Um, and, it, and even in humans, it's been shown to increase the concentration of tau that is circulating, meaning it's starting to break up those tangles and letting the tau move out of the, become back to normal levels. Um, so this, is, I think, is in a phase one clinical trial at this point in time. And again, this is an anti-tau therapy. Now, of course, one possibility is down the road is you may combine therapies. Some of these that are very good against beta amyloid, you may want to combine with something that works particularly well against tau. All right. Now, another issue with these antibodies is they can cause inflammation in the brain, and that's due to certain components in the antibody itself. So recently, there's been an antibody described, this, this alpha A beta gas 6. And what this does, this antibody does not cause inflammation in the brain. So it has a fragment of it that targets beta amyloid. So the idea is, again, you're going after the beta amyloid plaque and trying to clear out these aggregates. But it's also fused or attached to this receptor binding domain of growth arrest specific 6 or gas 6. So what GAS6 does, it binds to these, I'll refer to the term kind of garbage receptors, okay? So what happens in our brain is we have certain cellular receptors that grab all types of things that are determined to be bad within the brain. And then there are, those are engulfed in the cells and then just removed from the brain, okay? It's a very general process, but taking advantage of that allows cells to remove the beta amyloid and it reduces the inflammation that may occur in the brain, which is a potential problem with these types of antibodies. So I think this is a very interesting construct that addresses not only the removing of the beta amyloid, but also some of the side effects that may occur with the antibodies described here. Now, I also mentioned one of the things that happens during Alzheimer's disease is we do have inflammation in the brain. And there's thoughts of, well, maybe we need to target some of that inflammation that occurs too. So there's also a strategy now um, by inhibiting so-called inflammasome. This is what's responsible for inflammation, um, where there's the activation of something called interleukin-1b. And again, this is kind of early on, but I think this is a very interesting strategy. And again, we may ultimately get to a stage where we're using multiple drugs to fully combat the disease, depending upon what we feel are the, are the real problems here. And again, it's another point I want to make, most of these antibodies are developed for people with early stage Alzheimer's. 
When one starts to think about as Alzheimer's progresses, it may be necessary to start to use combinations of therapies to more effectively fight the disease. Okay, so now this is a very complicated slide, but there's some important points I wanna make because for all of these drugs that are potential drugs I've, des I've described, they have to go from the blood into the brain, okay? And this is not an easy task because we have something called the blood-brain barrier, and its role is to prevent things from getting into the brain. So most things that get into the brain have to get into a very specific mechanism. Sometimes you have these receptor and transporters where these are packaged, different things are packaged and move across to get into the brain. You do have some solute carrier mediated transport that can bring things in. And some things do diffuse in, they just get into the brain, but not that many things, all right? When we're talking about antibodies, which is what most of these drugs are, antibodies do not get through the blood-brain barrier very well. So this is really a problem in terms of their delivery. And in fact, one of the problems, I'll go back to our one FDA approved uh, drug, is that its percentage of getting into the brain is something like 0.15%, it's really low. So it doesn't do very well getting across that blood brain barrier. So we need to think about, okay, as these various potential therapeutics are designed, how are we going to get them into the brain in a more efficient manner than would normally occur because of the fact the brain just doesn't let a lot of things get in. So now this is uh, some research that FAU is part of, and this is using a technology called uh, MO, MR guided focused ultrasound. So magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound. And how this technology works, I'll explain it over the next couple of slides, is that there is a special helmet that a patient will, will fit into. This helmet produces ultrasound. And the ultrasound is going to help in making the blood brain barrier more susceptible to allowing drugs to go through it. Um, ultimately this helmet and the patient are moved into the magnetic resonance instrument. So this can be continuously monitored by imaging as it goes along. So I think this is a little bit better view now of what's going on during the process. We have our patient here who has, you know, potentially has Alzheimer's disease. They are inside this helmet, which is where the ultrasound is going to be delivered. And then all of this is moved into the uh, magnetic resonance instrument. And one can continually monitor what's going on in the brain during this process. Okay. Now, okay, so how does this MR guided focus ultrasound work? So here is the patient who is going to be have this helmet on. And really this is a focused ultrasound that can occur in any direction or multiple directions targeting different parts of the brain. So it can be very specific in terms of where you may wanna open the blood brain barrier. There, the, there are these micro bubbles that are injected. And what happens is as you have the focused ultrasound with these bubbles, you start to open up the blood brain barrier and now different agents can get through. Now, this sounds like you know, an excellent approach in terms of drug delivery into the brain, but there are obviously some real concerns with this, which is how well can we control this process. It's not just opening the blood brain barrier, then we want it to close back up again so we don't have things we don't want getting into the brain. Okay, so I'm gonna show some images now of, what's, of how this ultrasound is used and some of the results from it. Uh, first, we're gonna start with some Alzheimer's disease patients. Now this is really the first images that were produced in a patient. This came out in 2021. And what you can see is that treatment of the patient, what we're looking for is an imaging agent. So the idea here is that you're gonna use the ultrasound to open up the blood brain barrier, let this imaging agent get in and see how well the imaging agent penetrates into the brain, but also closing the blood brain barrier to see that the imaging agent is then gone. Okay, so when we start, there's virtually no imaging agent in the brain here over three hours, I believe this is, you can now see the imaging agent show up quite well. And in 24 hours, blood brain barrier is now closed, imaging agent is gone. So it looks like, first of all, this is very efficient at getting the imaging agent in. 
And also it's very efficient closing the blood brain barrier back up. So we don't have a constant leakage into the brain. Um, now, the idea of using an imaging, imaging agent is just really to demonstrate the potential for drug delivery, okay? Um, you can do it with a simple molecule, something that's quite small to see how well the technology works overall. Okay, so now let me just talk about drug delivery, but I have to switch to a different application because up to this point in time, there has been no drug delivery to an Alzheimer's disease patient, okay? But this same technology has been applied to brain cancer. And there are some very recent results that I think can show how effectively a drug can be delivered using this technology. So in this case, we're still using our ultrasound. It's exactly the same procedure I've been describing, but this was used for patients who started with breast cancer and it's now metastasized to the brain. So these are what's called HER2 positive brain metastases. So this, tar so this particular antibody targets the uh, human epidermal growth factor two receptor, the HER2 receptor, which can be overexpressed in certain types of uh, breast cancer. And what this antibody does, it will stop cancer cells from dividing. So the first part of this study that they did was looking at patients and just seeing how well is this antibody delivered into the brain using this technology. So if we look at the various images, and let's just start, um, again, we have the without and the with, Okay, and there are two patients shown here. And you can see in this image, um, you know, here is, uh, excuse me, here is where the, um, the, the tumor is. Um, when we uh, open up the blood brain barrier, there's much more effective delivery of the antibody into the tumor. Uh, it's shown a little bit better in these images where you can see it's kind of dark here, but gets much lighter here. Um, if we go on to this particular example, um, and look here, you can see how much more of the antibody has now been delivered when you actually open the blood-brain barrier, where this is delivery without it. So this addresses what I was talking about earlier, the difficulty in getting antibodies into the brain for treatment, and now it's much more effective when we can use this uh, ultrasound approach. Okay, so you can deliver this but the question is, you know, how effective is this as a treatment, right? You're, you're increasing the amount that's being delivered, but does it really do anything for the patient? So again, I'll just stick to this approach because as I mentioned, there hasn't been any studies done with Alzheimer's patients yet. So now we're looking at patients three months after they've been treated by this antibody. And again, using the, um, the ultrasound based delivery. So here you have you know, baseline of tumor that's in the brain. Now this treatment of the antibodies using the focused ultrasound over three months, and you can see quite a bit of shrinkage of the tumor. Uh, this patient, very similar. In fact, um, all the patients, this occurs, some a little less dramatically than others, where this was, is I think quite dramatic. So in this case, the antibody delivery is allowing patient treatment and, and obviously some favorable results in terms of shrinking tumors. And typically these are very, very hard to treat tumors once we get to the brain metastasis from the breast cancer. All right, so this looks extremely promising. Um, as I said though, this isn't particularly far along for Alzheimer's patients. So we are now part of this clinical trial, which is going to be Again, it's Alzheimer's disease patient treatment here in South Florida. FAU is teamed up with Delray Medical Center, which is part of Tenant Healthcare. And we're one of three sites in Florida that's going to be part of this clinical trial, one of six sites nationwide. So we're gonna be using this technology to treat Alzheimer's disease patients. I think our first patient is actually scheduled to be treated in another week. Um, this was supported by the State of Florida Board of Governors and Appropriation Research University Alzheimer's Research using Exablate Neurofocused Ultrasound, a little bit of a convoluted title, but nonetheless, this has been supported um, with a $1.5 million appropriation. Um, we're using this not only to treat patients, but also to develop potentially new biomarkers, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. And really, this is part of two clinical trials um, where, again, part of this is a look at the safety of 
opening up the blood brain barrier in this treatment of Alzheimer's disease. But ultimately where we wanna go is being able to use some of these therapeutic agents to see if they're more effectively delivered in the case of Alzheimer's disease patients. Okay, so now let me talk about detection and diagnosis because this is a whole another issue in terms of Alzheimer's disease. I mentioned earlier about the positron emission tomography approach to detect Alzheimer's where you're looking at beta amyloid. Now positron, positron emission tomography is, is not cheap. It's also not always readily available. Um, one would like a detection strategy that is less expensive, a little more convenient. The other strategy that's used is a lumbar puncture. Uh, patients do not like that. Um, so what we've been really thinking about is can we develop detection strategies, not only for people having Alzheimer's, but also for whether the treatments are effective or not. Okay, so again, you have these biomarkers that tell you whether someone has certain indications of Alzheimer's and also whether a treatment may be working well. I've talked about the imaging of the brain and I mentioned the problems there in the sense that it is expensive, it's not always uh, readily available. So we start to think about the blood, okay? Are there, th are there markers in the blood that can tell us about Alzheimer's disease? Um, and what are those biomarkers? Are there things that are more gene-based? Are they protein-based? Let's see what we have. Okay, so right now there is a lot of interest in developing a blood test, okay? Because this is really gonna be much more convenient than any of the other methods I've talked about for detecting Alzheimer's disease and detecting whether a treatment strategy is effective. So we really want these blood-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Now, so quite a bit of research has gone into validating the beta amyloid and tau in the blood by comparing blood-based results to imaging and also co cognitive testing. Um, new research on blood tests have also included some other potential biomarkers. Um, alpha synuclein, um, neurofilament light, and others. And I'm gonna talk about these in just a few moments. So there's biomarkers even beyond what I've talked about as some of the disease causing agents. And this is some of the work that we're doing also based on that funding that was supplied through the Board of Governors. Okay, so you know I, I've spent a lot of time talking about beta amyloid. Um, I'll, I'm gonna go back to tau because tau can be detected in the blood. Um, and there are some aspects of it that um, are very positive. For example, one of the forms of tau that has a phosphate group on it, this so-called tau-217, appears to be very specific to Alzheimer's and can be measured in the blood. And it looks like by measuring this, you can distinguish Alzheimer's from other neurodegenerative disorders. So this has become a rather interesting biomarker for detection of Alzheimer's. Now, again, part of what we're interested in is also using these biomarkers for telling whether a treatment is working or not. And that can be a little bit of a different story. But nonetheless, this has come out as a potential biomarker in the blood, so that's good. Um, and um, it's still, again, this is still in the research stage. This has not been approved. But again, this is going to be more easily administered versus the other methods I've talked about for detection. Okay, now, beta amyloid. So, this is complicated, and again, we're going to have to talk a little bit of science here. There's a lot going on in this slide, but here's our blood-brain barrier again. Here's the brain, here's the blood. Now, when thinking about treatment strategies for removing beta amyloid, this gets very complicated because one of the things that I mentioned is that an antibody is supposed to come along and target this beta amyloid in the brain and then remove it going through the blood-brain barrier. Now, we can potentially facilitate this process by using the ultrasound, which will allow the antibody to get in much easier and potentially get out much easier. But this transport from the brain through the blood-brain barrier does not happen by magic, okay? The antibody doesn't really know what to do. It's grabbing the beta amyloid. How does it get out of here? So there are a number of mechanisms by which beta amyloid is removed from the brain. It binds to different proteins, such as alpha-2 macroglobulin or ApoE in the, in the two and three isoforms. And then that is all shuttled to a receptor, this LRP1, okay? Once LRP1 gets this complex, 
it's moved out of the brain into the blood. Okay, that's great. However, there is a competing process going the other way, and that's this receptor called RAGE, where now beta amyloid's going this way and it's being brought into the brain. So it's important to understand as we look at these different treatment strategies, not just how much beta amyloid is around, but how much of these other factors come into play. For example, if there's very low levels of LRP1 and very high levels of rage, well, you got a problem because this is not gonna get cleared out very efficiently and it's going to get pulled back into the brain very efficiently. So amongst the biomarkers we are interested in as we're developing different strategies is looking at these two receptors. How much is there and also are they mutated in the disease and does that affect their ability to function? We're also interested in these carrier proteins. Again, if their levels are low, then there's a problem in getting that beta amyloid cleared out of the brain. So that's, you know, so, so this biomarker analysis gets to be kind of complicated because there are a number of factors to consider. So now here is what's part of our panel I'll call at FAU as we're looking at biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease treatment. Okay, so this falls under the category of RNA analysis. We're looking at the expression levels of genes, DNA, DNA analysis, are there mutations, and then mass spectrometry analysis, which looks at the amount of protein that's there. So three different things to consider and a number of different biomarkers or potential biomarkers. So I talked about these two receptors, the LRP1, which transports the beta amyloid out of the brain, and RAGE, which transports beta amyloid into the brain. So in the RNA analysis, we wanna know what are the levels of each of this? Is this going up? Is this going down or vice versa? Then we look at these transport proteins that grab the beta amyloid, this alpha-2M, and this transtheridin. We wanna know the same thing. Are they going up or down? Because that's gonna tell us some things about a treatment strategy. Let's say a treatment strategy is not particularly effective, but it might be ineffective, not because the drug is no good, but because this may be low and this may be high. So we need that information. We also wanna know about mutations in these two receptors and determine if those mutations affect their ability to transport beta amyloid. Finally, looking at protein levels. Well. We want to know beta amyloid. We want to know how much is in the brain, how much is out of the brain. That's pretty straightforward. We have a couple of different forms of this tau protein that are phosphorylated. I mentioned that 217, it's also 181. Um, we want to know what's going on with, with tau. Is it staying in the brain? Is it out in the blood? Now, there's also, I mentioned briefly, this APOE, which has several isoforms. <clears throat> there's an uh, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, and epsilon 4 allele. It turns out the APOE, if you have a lot of the epsilon-4 allele, that disrupts clearance of beta amyloid, where two and three aid it. So you want to know, do you have a lot of this form versus these other forms? Um, there is this GFAP, which is an indicator of neuroinflammation. You certainly want to know if your drug treatment is working, how is neuroinflammation being affected, inflammation in the brain? Uh, NFL, that looks at neuronal exonal injury, okay? Does this start to go down, right? Um, there's this particular metabolite, which indicates membrane turnover is occurring. That's a bad thing. <clears throat> We'd like to see that be reduced. And then finally, there's our marker of, additional marker of inflammation in the brain is interleukin-1 beta. So we've really put this panel together, and this is what we're starting to look at. But to do this, well, some things are pretty straightforward. Gene analysis, gene mutations, that's pretty straightforward. To do this mass spectrometry analysis, one needs a very sophisticated instrument, a very sophisticated mass spectrometer that can measure low levels of these different proteins. So again, through this money that we received from the Florida Board of Governors, we have bought this uh, very uh, sophisticated mass spectrometer. This is referred to as an Orbitrap. And there's a picture of it. it, looks nice and clean in this picture. It looks a little bit dirtier in the lab, but anyway, you get the idea. And this has been operational at FAU starting in August of 2022. So we're gonna to start to do our biomarker work now that we have this up and running. Okay, so really, you know, what are our ultimate goals here in terms of Alzheimer's disease? 
And what we'd really like to do is change the trajectory of this disease, both through early detection and then potential application of these different therapeutic agents, and of course, monitoring of treatment strategies to determine if other types of therapeutic approaches need be. So if we look at what the projection is right now, which is this line here, but if we're able to develop a treatment by 2025 that will just delay the onset of Alzheimer's by five years, and then we start to go this way, that will result in 5.7 million people who are expected to develop Alzheimer's in 2050 who would not, okay? So that's really a big difference. And this is really what we're looking at in terms of a lot of these treatment strategies, being able to target the disease at very early stages, potentially even before the disease has any significant impact. Of course, at the same time, we'd like treatment strategies that one could at least benefit some of the people in later stages. But it's really a matter of reducing these projections to really decrease and quite significantly decrease the number of people who will have to deal with this disease. And that's it for today. So I'll be happy to deal with questions. Thanks so much, Greg. Just as a reminder, if you have any question for Dr. Fields, please open the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen and you can type your questions there. So um, as you mentioned, Greg, there are actually the, the drugs that are currently on the market for Alzheimer's don't necessarily do the job that um, we would like them to do, right? And you mentioned that part of that problem is this blood-brain barrier that you already are working on and opening up. Um, but the, the question here is uh, why so many companies are still pursuing these mm -hmm. type of drugs. And yeah. then you mentioned actually a good number of them that are sort right. of like functioning all on the beta amyloids, right? Right. And, 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 the, and, you know, there hasn't been a great demonstration of certainly restoration of cognitive function. In some cases, it looks like there's, there's a little bit of slowing of the decline. So there, there, there are two thoughts about this. One is the drugs themselves, because they deliver at so low levels, it, you know, will one of the things that will improve the use or, or, or the results from those type of treatments being if you can just get them more effectively into the brain? Will that make a bigger difference? Yeah. Okay. Now, but the other part I'll add is, you know, early on I talked about the formation of beta amyloid inside the cell, right? Yeah. There's a lot going on that's bad inside the cell, okay, that ultimately manifests itself into this disease. And that's starting to be better understood. So one of the potential targeting strategies is to look at some of these pathways that are going bad inside the cell. I think in the question you talked about some of the metabolic pathways that you know, may prove more effective, especially early on in, in, in the disease. And it's, you know, it's tough to say right now because so much of the field has been driven by the beta amyloid hypothesis, which is the fact that the beta amyloid occurs outside the cells. And that's, you know, really the manif that's really the manifestation of the disease where it may be something that's a much earlier event. Um, but yeah, the targeting still goes on to clear the plaques because it's felt that that is gonna at least result in some improvement for the patient, right? Even if you can cut down some of the cell cytotoxicity, that's, that's a bonus. Um, and I think what we really need to see is as we get to the stage of more effectively delivering these drugs, then do they make a difference or not? And it may be a case of, we can improve their delivery, you know, their ability across the delivery barrier by, by quite a number of factors, but they may, you know, that may not be what we really need to shoot for. And, and clearly more and more research in terms of the mechanisms of this disease are focusing on those early cellular behaviors. Um, and, 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 but that's, you know, that's kind of the nature. This is, this is a very tricky disease in terms of what its origins are what goes wrong early on and, you know, what stages you can tackle it at, you know, in terms of early versus later stages. Right. Um, you mentioned your, um, the, the clinical study on the ultrasound ablation. Um, mm -hmm. Do you expect there will be any um, concerns on drug concentration? Right now you're, you're dosing patients mm -hmm. with these beta amyloid, uh, yeah. to, you know, targeting drugs. Uh, at a certain concentration, if you're opening the blood-brain barrier, so more of the drug gets in your brain than currently, 
Do you yep. expect there will be any concerns uh, in these studies uh, with the concentration? Yeah, I think absolutely. And one, I think what you're going to need to do as this moves along is look at the efficiency, the improved efficiency of something like the, um, you know, the imaging agent I showed, and also look at the improved efficiency. I think look at you know going to the um, case I showed of the brain cancer. Okay, because there is an antibody. You look at how well it crosses, and you're going to have to yes back calculate because the concentrations they currently use the one approved Alzheimer's treatment antibody at. I don't think any way, any way in the world you want to use that concentration if you're doing the blood-brain barrier opening. It's a very high concentration. And I think you want to back off of that. Um, but yeah, those type of things, you're, you're probably going to see some similar studies to the brain cancer one where you're going to want to label the antibody so you can determine how efficiently it gets into the brain, okay, and image it, and then be able to quantify, okay, this is what we see get in now. How do we want to then use the doses for you know, really therapeutic applications. Uh, related to um, treatment and, and different forms of treatment, we have a question here regarding uh, alternative, um, uh, uh, targeting alternative pathways, and, and for example, targeting metabolic pathways, for example, mm -hmm. the NAD plus depletion, estrocytic GABA release, and putrescine production via the ammonia detoxification cycle. These are all very long uh, scientific words, but can you talk a little bit about targeting some of these other mechanisms, metabolic mechanisms? In right. Our bodies? So this falls along the lines of just, you know, I was mentioning a few moments ago, which is people starting to look at what's happening inside the various cells, looking at things that go wrong. So first one has to evaluate what are the things that go wrong? And then is there an effective way to target that? Of course, the consideration is always, do you affect normal cells versus disease cells? Um, and I think we're pretty early on in the stages of developing these different inhibitors. One thing I mentioned in talking about these potential agents, one that I'm kind of interested in is this inflammasome inhibitor that's being developed, because that's directly targeting interleukin-1-beta, which some feel is, is a key player early on in this disease. Um, but of course, you still need processing of interleukin-1 beta for some normal functions. Um, but any of these others, I mean, there's all types of metabolic dysregulation going on here. There's, there's some poor um, acidification processes that go on in the lysosomes. It, you know, there's a lot to look at. And part of it is considering, you know, what, how, how effectively can you target some of these potentially, you know, apparent pathways. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities out there. And I think that as time goes on, we are going to see more potential therapeutic approaches that don't just target clearing out the beta amyloid or clearing out the tau. I think we're going to get into things that are, that are uh, more fine-tuned into pathways that are, are going wrong. Great. We have several questions here with regard to that um, MRI capped ultrasound that you mentioned uh, that are related to um, patient recovery. Right. 24 hours after the drug de deliver uh, after you're using this this type of drug delivery method. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So before we even got involved in this clinical trial, and I'll say, I mean, I'm the program director, so I was really nervous about this, right? <laughs> because you're opening up the blood brain barrier and you're saying, uh, I hope this goes well, right? And a bunch of toxic things don't get into the brain. But there have been quite a number of clinical trials before with control patients. Okay. So patients who no disease, anything like that just looking to see if this technology is safe and how long the blood-brain barrier is open, how well you can control that. So it looks like the period is somewhere around three hours between, you know, they open it, whatever is going to, you know, get in, get in and then it's, then, it's, then it's back to normal. And really after looking at quite a number of those clinical trials, most of which were performed in Israel, um, I mean, the data looked great. The patients were really, were fine. Um, so that, you know, created a little bit of comfort in moving forward with this whole procedure and now looking at patients who, who you know, do have a variety of, of, of neurological disorders, right? This is only confined to Alzheimer's or brain cancer. I mean, we're talking about people who are being treated with this who have Parkinson's, have essential tremor. So, you know, but now, yeah, no, I, there's, a, I think, a comfort level based on the number of clinical trials that were done with control patients and also being able to define how long this blood-brain barrier is permeable for, um, how quickly it closes up. 
Are there any, uh, as a follow-up to that, are there any concerns uh, for patients who have underlying arterial disease? So there's very tight exclusion criteria for these type of treatments, okay? I'll say that. So yeah, you're going to see, I mean, unfortunately, there will be people who will not qualify based on other, you know, comorbidities, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, in your opinion, uh, of how about uh, gene therapy as an alternative to uh, protein therapy? Oh, sure. And, and especially if we're, as we start to learn what really the, the problems are here, you know, is it a case of that we're going to be able to, you know, correct, excuse me, correct a pathway that has gone bad? Okay. Right. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things I discussed is something like the mutations that occur in the two receptors. And, you know, if, and, and again, I don't know, this. this is a very unexplored area. And this is part of what we're going to find out in our biomarker study. Let's say mutation occurs, and that's really significant in either the transport out of the brain or the transport into the brain. Would you want to then try to do something with that particular receptor? Do you want to, you know, try to again, use gene therapy to create something that is now more normalized. You know, I think the possibilities are there. We do need, I mean, there's, there's a lot more information to obtain. And, and you know, as, as you look into, like I said, the complexities of this disease, so much is focused on just certain areas that there's much more to go. Um, and I think the opportunity for therapeutic intervention, there's going to be, you know, there may be a host of different strategies. Right. Uh, another question uh, regarding what to target <laughs> in these <laughs> therapies is targeting uh, a question on thoughts on targeting the inflammasome and cutting down the oxidative stress that has yep. been known to contribute to neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. So, and, and that's actually why I mentioned, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned um, the inflammasome inhibitor when I, or some of the inflammasome stuff when I talk about potential therapeutic agents. I think that has some real possibilities. Okay, and that's starting to get into this targeting inside the cell and looking at something that has very specifically gone bad. Now, you know, the question is, what is the targeting there? Right now, it's, it's enzyme targeting, okay, um, using enzyme-based inhibitors. And, but I think that that has, that has a lot of potential. Absolutely. Great. Um, uh, switching over to, you mentioned early detection, um, and just a follow-up question here, can uh, Alzheimer be detected in early in blood or saliva tests? Oh, that's that's what one of the things we're really shooting for, because yeah. some of the blood-based tests that already exist, so the beta amyloid ratio um, is a blood-based test and, and two forms of tau, uh, phosphorylated tau. The problem there is that Sometimes those ratios can be affected by other things. So saying that they're just, okay, you have Alzheimer's or you have a certain stage of Alzheimer's or a treatment strategy is effective, they're not good enough. Um, you know, there, there are other, you know, other things that can occur that can affect those levels. So really, you know, that's why the need, you know, I mentioned one of the slides that this, this really this great desire to come up, it's not just going to be, you know, two, two biomarkers, it's got to be a panel. And you've got to have a good understanding of how different things relate to each other. And that will really let you know what's going on specifically in the disease. And, you know, as I get into this business about the whole transport mechanisms and the receptors, even for the beta amyloid part, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that that hasn't been a part of some of the biomarker detection, because Again, you know, being able to say whether the beta amyloid is getting in or out of the brain is dependent on quite a number of other factors that I think you need to look at. And that doesn't even touch on some of the other things that may be occurring in the disease. So I think we're still a, a, a good distance away from what I would call a really good biomarker panel for the blood, but at least we're making some inroads. And, we, and I think we have an idea of some of the things to look at. That's great. That's promising. Can you talk a little bit about whether or not Alzheimer's uh, can be inherited? So what they've shown is that if you really look at the number of patients who have what it would appear to be these inheritable traits, it's a very small number of Alzheimer's patients. Um, I mean, it's something like, I think it's less than 5%. Okay. So it does not appear to be an inherited disease. Um, which again makes it 
more complicated to deal with because then you're talking about factors that occur over a lifetime. And, you know, I, I think most people are pretty aware there's quite a bit of work going on now and, and, uh, and, and, and various symposia that talk about Alzheimer's prevention. So different factors that we know seem to contribute to Alzheimer's when you look at people who get Alzheimer's and what's going on. And, and you know, quite a number of these factors are ones that we can control. Now, it doesn't mean if we get them all under control, you're not going to get Alzheimer's disease, right? But it does certainly start to move in favor. And, and again, a lot of these are other disease-based too, right? Things, you know, we, we, we talk about various aspects of diet and exercise and cardiovascular health. Those all seem to contribute into the, you know, the, the, the probability of getting Alzheimer's disease. So there's many factors. Yeah, genetics just doesn't seem to be a big contributor. The only part genetically that has been has shown anything is I mentioned about the APOE and the APOE isoforms, uh, isoform two, three, four. If you have APOE isoform, the epsilon four, yes, your chances of getting Alzheimer's do increase. Okay, but to my knowledge, that's like the one genetic factor that's been shown, and it's still not and even close to being absolute. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about prevention and what uh, are factors that have been shown to uh, contribute to Alzheimer's prevention? Yeah, no, I, you know, I started to touch on those a little bit. Um, again, you get into this business about, about diet. People talk about the Mediterranean diet, and that seems to be one that if people uh, eat in that fashion, they seem to be less susceptible to Alzheimer's. Uh, again, this cardiovascular health really critical. There just seems to be an absolute link between that and, and getting Alzheimer's. Um, so when you think about the different things that affect cardiovascular health, you know, cholesterol levels, um, again, things like exercise, um, certainly one a, a, as far as, um, you know, keeping, you know, weight under relative control, all of these come into play. Diabetes, okay, people who are diabetic have a much a greater chance of getting Alzheimer's. But I think that that's also related to cardiovascular health. You know, there are things people who, have, who are diabetic, their, their vascular system tends to be more susceptible to problems. So, you know, there's, there's this whole host of things, but it falls in line with a lot of what we're learning for a lot of different diseases. Even, you know, I talk about, you know, ways to, to try to deal with cancer prevention and, and it's almost all the same factors, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of where we are on, on, on this for trying to think about prevention. Great, thanks so much, Greg. And we are unfortunately out of time. I see we have a couple of more questions in the chat. So we're gonna have you answer those offline and then post the answers on our website. So thank okay. you everybody for calling in. Thank you very much, Greg. We'll hope to see you again in a couple of weeks. Yep. Very good. Good day, bye-bye. <laughs>